is super, super fascinating. So many different things to, to talk about. We only have 10 minutes, so, so we'll dive right in. I was just asking Bob, actually, if he'd had his genome sequence when we were standing in the hallway, and you said... Uh, yes, I did, as part of a, a physical. And actually, some um, usable things were found about clotting, proclivity, et cetera. Me too. Yeah. Factor V Leiden? Yes, exactly. Uh, the Northern common. European warrior clan that... Uh, Maybe we're related. We should do our 23 andmes <laughs> and see if we can connect them. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about this from a business perspective. And I guess, you know, let's start broadly. I mean, where do you see the biggest opportunity coming from having sequenced the genome almost 15 years ago? Well, I, I think the, the benefits in, in, uh, for the general population is that it really is affecting things today and obviously for the long term. The most significant change is I think there's a renewed optimism that we're going to really make a difference in the incredible uh, intractable diseases of the, of the aging, Alzheimer's, metabolic disease, cancer. And so and that whole retooling of the R&D infrastructure in America over the last 15 years is now showing the promise why we have thousands of new drugs in development today because of that retooling and the fundamental science that was done through the, the mapping of the human genome. So that's, that's clearly the long-term benefit. That is so significant because if we don't deal with those issues in the next 10, 15 years, the cost of just caring for Alzheimer's patients and cancer patients, metabolic disease of the elderly, we're going to undermine the economic fabric of our society. There will be no discretionary spending. So it's such an imperative that we take this technology and apply it in a way that really solves these uh, social issues. On the near term, areas, I think we've seen tremendous impact on patients already. There are more than 100 approved drugs by the FDA that have genomic information in the labeling that provides either specific patient populations or how to use the drug in a way. So patients today, because of the science advances that have been made over the past decade, are significantly safer being treated better, or not being treated with the drugs they shouldn't be treated with, they're being used more effectively from dosing regimens, et cetera, and therefore quality of life is even better, if not, in fact, extension of life has been achieved. So, and then and you heard earlier, I think one of the other benefits that's happening is that the reality of it is that we have to make sure that we're more efficient in how we deliver our, or develop our drugs, and therefore, we've got to use the technology to ensure that we have the highest probability of only testing drugs in the people we believe scientifically and medically that they're going to work in. And so therefore, that's, that should help us reduce the costs, accelerate, uh, compress the time it takes to get drugs approved. So I think there's near-term benefits that we've already gained in our society because of the investment in, in what we've done here, both the public and the private sectors, and the medium term, and the long term, it gives us promise, and it's an incredibly exciting time to be involved in trying to tax some of those long term issues. Well, I remember the, the speech that uh, Bill Clinton gave when the genome was sequenced, and you're talking about curing diseases like Alzheimer's, cancer, and a lot of people kind of expected that to be, you know, around the corner, immediate. And, you know, when it comes to Alzheimer's especially, we are nowhere close, unfortunately. Um, where would you say we kind of are versus expectations, you know, in that progress toward actually solving some of these things? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, f a fair question, a fair commentary that you know, some of it was discussed in the earlier panel that the part of the progress has been really breaking down the patient populations to really understand the targeted populations, whether it was the ALK, non-small cell lung cancer, we talked about Crizotinib and, and Pfizer and, and the issues. We have a drug that was approved for myelodysplastic syndrome that only for people that have a specific chromosomal deletion in the 5Q area. So the, we, the, we're making good progress, and part of the progress is we're reducing, there isn't one breast cancer, there's a hundreds breast cancer. So the ability to really redefine disease and then for attack it in its uh, fundamental genomic, proteomic uh, uh, initiation that we can really def cure the, have much more significant progress made. It. And I think that's gonna be the continuation of the trend. We all are hoping for a silver bullet of immunotherapy or stem cell therapies, and we, we, we invest an awful lot of money in those. We're very excited about the promise of still fight, searching for the silver bullet, but part of that silver bullet is really breaking the populations down to really understand these are different diseases, different causes, and can be treated differently, and, and that's the reality of it. And, and that's, I think, a part of the multi-prong approach that we're all taking to attack the disease most effectively. So there was some interesting discussion on the last panel about cost and whether these personal therapies, personalized therapies, will be even more expensive because a smaller market means you have to charge more, kind of like the orphan drug business model. How do you look at that and what will bring costs down ultimately? Yeah, I think it's a very important issue. Our society has 
fewer, more, uh, not many more significant issues to challenge, but the cost of caring for aging population versus the pace of innovation to deal with for solutions that it's a fundamental social issue in all the developed world. We've got to, we've got, we've got to deal with it, and this is part of the solution. I think we have to recognize that we've got to make the investments now. We've got to figure out how do we make it more cost effective. There were some of the conversations that were discussed earlier. We need to make data more interoperable so people really can share the kind of data that's available so that we're not reinventing the wheel. We did a deal with Columbia, Mount, uh, a collaboration with Columbia, Mount Sinai, uh, Johns Hopkins, University of Pennsylvania, the, the cancer centers there, that they would collaborate on everything but the basic invention. We still want competition for the basic invention, but then they shouldn't re redo the Bio, the, the biostatistics, the analytics, the data analytics, et cetera. So they share that and they share the intellectual property and they'll share the royalties if we ever produce a drug out of the initiative. So we've got to redefine the way we think about R&D to be more collaborative, which was talked about earlier, to find, to reduce redundancy, not lose the American competitive spirit, because that's one of the great reasons why the whole ecosystem of biomedical innovation is headquartered in the United States is because the environment is so positive for that kind of collaboration and, and, and competition, but people really producing great results. So from an economic point of view, I think we also have to be very careful that as we think about how do we manage these costs, and we have to be more effective. Earlier you talked about value drug pricing, et cetera, something we absolutely support, that I have to recognize the economic growth in America of the last 60, 70 years is 50% of the growth in GDP has really been contributed by the advances in public health and, and science and medicine to what we, what we do. And so we've got to be careful that we don't lose one of the great crown jewels of the United States economy and the benefit to its, its citizens is the whole ecosystem of biomedical innovation. So we've got to find these solutions. We've got to talk more aggressively about them. I think I'm more optimistic now that in the last couple of months at least we're having a debate and, a, and an integrated discussion. People are listening and saying, how do we attack both the issue of how can we afford the healthcare system that we want but yet at the same time invest for the future to solve these terrible problems we have as a society. It's not gonna be easy. No one's gore, ox is not gonna be gored. We, we've gotta do it in a way that produces long-term best solutions in a, in a way that everybody's at the table and engaged in it. And the other thing, I, I apologize for pontificating about it a little bit, but I think we gotta stop calling it healthcare, Obamacare and Trump care. Healthcare, it needs to be changed every one or two years because the world is changing and the dynamics change and we've got to continue to refine the way we think about public policy and managing health care both from a government and a private sector and we, when we make it so partisan because we attach these names to it, it makes it harder to do the kind of evolutionary change that we need to make every single year and we have to stand up and fight this and say no, it's, this can't be changed every eight years. Health care needs to be refined on an ongoing basis and, and hopefully the discussions that we're having now will start to begin that process, but it's one that is, we have very serious consequences if we don't recognize this has to go. It's always gonna be political, but we've gotta lessen the partisanship of it, in my opinion, if we're gonna produce the kind of really effective reforms that we need. Well, I think that's a really interesting idea. One of the questions that comes about with healthcare reform or anything really is, who pays for it? And so I want to ask you, when you think about how we learn more about the human genome and try to apply that, and you know, we see things like the Precision Medicine Initiative, but also these amazing projects folks like Regeneron are doing, do you think it's a company thing? Should it be a privately funded thing? Should it be a government funded thing? And then you have you know, Trump's proposal to cut the NIH budget by about 20%. So how, do we, how does that yeah. work? No, I, I think we have to look at things holistically. I think that we have many great examples of pre-competitive partnerships, that the collaboration is important, that we, 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 we have to be competitive for the invention. That's what really gives the, the great breakthrough is the individual lab, whether it's in an uh, academic institution or a, 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 a company or wherever it is, that great invention needs to be made and we want as many people focused on that as possible in our own little world. But things that are not necessarily fundamental to that invention, we've got to reduce the redundancies, we have to collaborate, we cannot afford to do the kinds of costs that everybody doing everything in a different way. So I think, I think the issue is that we, we want to retain the character of our system which has provided the kind of advances we've had. And you think about, people don't appreciate the great successes that we've had with cardiovascular disease, with AIDS. My kids don't even know there was ever an AIDS epidemic. It, the, we, have, we have really transformed the way, the way the world thinks about medicine. 
got to retain that, but at the same time do it in the reality of the economic world that we live in today. Well, we are just out of time, but I'll ask you one more question, if you don't mind, which is um, CRISPR. How soon do you see that, and, and do you, in what role do you see it playing in actual drug development and, and being used in people? Yeah. Um, we're certainly a significant investor in there, and, and, and we have 70 different programs involved in genomic, proteomic uh, drug discovery, and, and CRISPR is probably involved in 10 of those different programs. Uh, our, our view is, I think, that we've got to be careful, that we've got to really understand to find the, the nearest term practical, most serious diseases that we focus on, because the unintended consequences are still not completely known. So we're incredibly optimistic about it, but like all of the advances, we want to get very excited about it. We want to make sure we invest in it, but we've got to be sober about the prospects of it. But it's, it's a great tool, and, and we're hopeful that it's going to play a, a meaningful a role in, in kind of discoveries over the next few years. All right. Well, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.